So that's just starting, um, that's just starting the report now. So, um, like I say, we can be totally um, informal about this. Vicky and I will just do some introductions, um, and then we've got some things that we're going to chat through. But stick any comments in the notes. Oh, what I have to keep doing is keep my eye on the waiting room because if people join, then um, uh, we need to let them in. Uh, so, um, so my name's Joanne. I am the owner of Amaranth. Um, I have a health store in Stockport in Cheshire, um, and it's also got treatment rooms in there. Um, I'm also a nutritional therapist, um, so I've been working, I think, for about 12 years as a qualified nutritional therapist. Um, so I still do consultations um, from the clinic, and that's something actually that I've been picking up a little bit more doing the one-to-ones over the last um, few months because I had this strange idea I had some more time on my hand and actually <laughs> I filled it quite well with consultations um but also obviously doing the kind of nutrition and supplement <clears throat> advice on the shop floor as well um, so Vicky hello I'm Vicky um I'm a fully qualified nutritionist such as Joe um I trained under Patrick Holfers and I did my dipper AOM Ooh, 20 years or more ago now. Um, I'm also got a master's degree in complementary health studies and I did that with Exeter University. So that gave me a really lovely little umbrella to kind of like feel quite confident under. Um, but the big thing with me is I've worked in the health food industry for over 30 years. Um, my family business is being freaks. We have three stores based in Cardiff. So I'm one of you lot, you know, every day we're there dealing face to face with the public. And we just thought this was a great idea to bring everyone together to kind of get the best minds to give us a little lecture such as Phil but also be able to kind of share our experience and add something to that so um, we're really excited to move forward on this so so yeah lots of good things coming up so Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so um so tonight we are going to focus on immune health but if you missed um the last session the last session was about joint health um, and we were joined by Nature's Aid that did, did a presentation on that. The video and the handouts from that are now on the members section of the Health Store UK website. Um, if anybody needs any more information about where or where to go to, just drop me a message um, at the end of this and we can, um, we can send those details over to you. Yep. Basically, we're on the subject of videos. We thought we'd tell you a little bit about what we plan on upcoming as well. Um, so we will be producing a Health Stores UK protocols video. Um, most of you are familiar with the, the, the Health Store protocol, um, but basically we think that maybe it's a good time for us to have a refresh as well, particularly while we're discussing kind of nutrition and training and what we can and cannot talk about. Um, so we're making a little short video. There will be a handout and this will be on the members section as well. So it's again, another little thing in your arsenal for training up your staff really. So hopefully we'll get that done. Hopefully this side of January, but as soon as it's done, um, we will be letting you know. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I guess just a few reminders, because it's always useful um, for us all to do a little bit of a recap. And one thing I find as well is it is, um, I'm sure I'm telling everybody what they already know, but it is important to kind of keep reminding staff as well, because you, you, obviously our job is to um, offer cred credible advice, but within our scope of practice. So a few reminders from the protocol is that we should only be advising in a face-to-face um, -face, um, capacity. Um, we should always be asking our customers if they have any medical conditions or take medication and advising our customers who are on medication to check the suitability of any remedy suggested with um, their doctor. Um, so obviously just important to recognize that. And as we go through the training tonight um, and on the shop floor, et cetera, um, to take those things into account. And at the same time as well, there's certain conditions we cannot talk about, which is quite prudent today when we're talking about the immune system, because many of them are immune based issues. So things like arthritis, which was kind of a surprise to us. We can talk about joint care, but not arthritis directly. Um, cancer, obviously, most of you know that multiple sclerosis. AIDS and glycoma. Um, this can really present a bit of a dilemma when you're face to face with customers. Um, generally speaking, 
I usually up front with them and say, look, this isn't an area that we can cover in this capacity. However, there are a lot of things that we can do to work with them on a holistic basis, just working with their actual kind of their system as a whole of looking at their diet and making kind of generalized recommendations that they can follow. So they don't feel they've got a door slammed in their face. Also, I tend to have um, a list of kind of websites or um, contacts that I think that would be good for them. Um, a good example of this is Penny Braun um, Cancer Centre. I don't know if any of you have heard of that before. It's based in Bristol, um, but it's a local one to me, but you might have someone in your end as well, which is, again, someone who you would feel comfortable referring. It's well worth looking at the Penny Braun Cancer site. They used to be under the University of Warwick, they're also they're one of the leading kind of holistic complementary therapy uh, so they they understand the proper roads so it's nothing that your gp or anybody's doctor would have a problem with discussing with so they're a really good one um so again giving that bit of job <laughs> yeah so so let's move on to um talking about today's session I mean maybe that's something that again we can we can kind of look at as a collective looking at what those other resources um may be that we can kind of share and refer on to you know particularly if there's like national organizations that are useful for all of us we'll put that another one in our um to do pile um anyway on to today's session so as I said we're going to talk about immunity um delighted to be joined in a few minutes by Phil Beard who's the technical educator for Viridian um but it's always good in these sessions, I think, to share a little bit about what's happening um, in our stores, just from the perspective of, of Vicky and I. Um, but again, a general discussion amongst our stores is always worthwhile. So I'm certainly starting to see, you know, we, we are getting to that time of year um, when customers are asking about immune health. So how are you finding that in your store, Vicky? What sort of things are you hearing about? It's been really interesting during the pandemic, like I said, certainly rise of vitamin C sales, vitamin C zinc, it was almost astro uh, off the charts, really. Um, and I found, I don't know if any of you found this, but since kind of people have had the vaccination, there's almost been like a, a reluctance to think anything about immunity in some respects. They've been thinking, well, I've had the vaccine, so I'm OK. Um, and certainly that seems to be... a an issue that we countered really. Um, I don't know if that's something you found, Joe. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly not seeing that sort of great demand for preventative things. So we're seeing less sales of things like zinc, but we are still seeing um, kind of that that push towards those almost when people have got a symptom or recovery remedies. Um, beta glucan still sells an awful lot for us, um, astragalus, um, those two things particularly. And I think our team sort of have really got behind those. I guess we've all got certain things in our stores that um, we sort of get behind and we all like, and they seem to get really res good results for our customers. Um, yeah. Long COVID is still sort of hanging around as well. We're still getting some requests for things for that as well. I think that's really true, actually. Um, beta glucans and all things medicinal mushrooms are massive at the moment, and certainly that's a sector that's continuing to grow. Um, I work with them with a lot of clients, um, both within tonic forms and, and singularly, and they're a really great remedy to kind of start building the system up. There's another remedy I'm a big fan of is black elder. Um, again, loads of black elderberry tonics and black elderberry pills and potions out there. Um, and again, they work really well. The beautiful thing about black elder, it's one of those herbs that I've worked with every age group quite safely. So it, it's what the Chinese describe as a constitutional remedy. So it's a really good one for building the system up. And it tastes great. So it's not a hardship to get your customers to use it really. Um, I find as well at the moment having things like resources close to hand. So quite a few of our suppliers do like nice little immunity kind of handouts are really good. I also find them um, having like blackboards with have you taken your daily vitamin D. Um, again, that I know Phil is going to kind of elaborate on this, but big research on vitamin D and immune system and how we should really all be looking at about 4,000 IUs of vitamin D a day. And kind of these are things that are kind of safely kind of can be used on a long-term basis without ever hitting a toxicity. But again, this is 
Phil will kind of really go in for this one. But um, yeah, it's just having kind of pointed reminders for customers so we can start conversations. You know, I think, like I said, they may really like think that they have a bit more protect protection, but what we want to do is kind of, you know, really kind of boost them up a bit, really. So they're going into the winter fully prepared. Anyway, I'm really excited listening to Phil now and he can expand everything. And um, Joe. Yeah, yeah. So agree with everything you've said. And I think as well, just to add that, you know, things like the leaflet. So we've got the really good uh, winter wellness leaflet from Viridian. And having those kind of things around allows people to have something perhaps they can take home or they have a read through it so that when they do need it, they kind of remember it's there. So totally agree on that kind of marketing and the pointed information. People don't always need things right now, but it's what can, can they remember us when it when it comes to it? So what let um, we talked about lots of um, a few different remedies there that are our favorites. And um, a lot of those, I have to say, we do sell um, from Viridian. So um, we are, like I say, we're really pleased that Phil's with us. So we'll hand over now to Phil to tell us all about immunity. Um, hopefully there'll be some time for um, some questions at the end. Appreciate we're, we're kind of into everyone's evenings and you probably had a long day. But feel free to pop any um, questions in the messages um, or hopefully we'll have a bit of time to open up um, at the end. So hopefully, um, yeah, Phil's unmuted. Can you hear us, Phil? Are you there? I can, loud and clear. Excellent. Um, and this is where <laughs> it has to go to plan and we share our presentation. Um, there we go. So yeah, it, um, I guess start off with a little bit of introduction about yourself and Viridian. From there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thanks for having me again. And uh, I know Cheryl's on board listening uh, behind the scenes somewhere. So uh, hi, Cheryl. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's great to actually get the opportunity to talk about immunity to, to you guys. But again, it, it's very relevant at the moment, but I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail, but a bit about myself in terms of I've been a Viridian for about five years now uh, coming up, which is quite scary. Uh, give or take two years away from COVID, which is uh, kind of cheated out of, of well she does us all out of a, a bit of time but uh in terms of uh what i've been doing i i help with the education side of things i help with the research i help with the new development of products so we're always constantly working on new things and looking at how we can deliver better products or better kind of ways of delivering supplements as well so we want to provide the best quality products that we we physically can so whether that's by getting the best ingredients or whether that's getting the most research backed nutrients in there as well and the best formulations that we can provide also. So we're always looking at, at growing and building and making sure that we are kind of together as a team, bringing everything together from our from our technical side, from custom services to, to all the way down to our consumers. So we are looking at the bigger picture in terms of how we can provide that education to everybody and make sure that we're, we're given that, that idea of what we can do in terms of immunity. So. I will share my screen with you now and I will present my, bear with me. Okay, so we are talking about modulated immune system. I'm not, I'm not gonna go too sciencey. I wanna kind of just initially just explain the first bit. So I wanna kind of cover a little bit more about kind of post viral fatigue and a little bit about initial fatigue as well so i think a lot more people are worrying about that post viral side of things and kind of we can't always prevent every single condition so again we are looking at how we can kind of mitigate the symptoms but also prevent those long term issues as well but initially we all know about the innate and second stage adaptive immunities but what we're seeing in terms of those who are who have frequent illnesses are those who struggle to get from that first stage into that second stage. So bridging that gap together. So getting to that point where we're creating those lymphocyte cells and getting the ability to prevent or create those antigen presenting cells as well. So our body's very good at that initial phase of creating the, the scattergun approach around of just trying to kill all sorts of immune or any threats coming into the body. So we are quite good at that and that's where we have a lot of nutrients for that as well so your beta glucans and astragalus and elderberry like there's so many different ones that can help improve or balance out our immune system and bring it up to a point where we can actually work on preventing a pathogen coming in so when i look at the first phase i always kind of look at it as the pac-man approach we're going to go out and we're going to hunt down those those 
pathogens and engulf them basically so we're looking at those that that side of things through the macrophages and just again the the phagocytes and just killing anything and everything wherever we want so again it's not very targeted but we know that so <clears throat> that's when we're looking more into that second stage the adaptive phase and this is where it becomes more crucial so it's it's hard to con fully understand exactly how we can deal with it for some people and again covid has has thrown it all out in, into the air in terms of what we're seeing and how which so well which types of people are more prone to certain conditions as well so it, it, it's it's weird but we can look at the nutrients and the in kind of where we can see that the missing links between that as well and there's so many different areas that we can look at but again what we want to ideally do is build that or prevent that that gap so we've not getting these replication of immune cell or these replication of viruses com constantly working so if we can bridge that gap gap a little bit closer we can kind of prevent that that approach of just spreading out the that innate inflammation and that's the cytokines being released and causing the the low grade inflammation longer term so again if we can just slightly bridge that gap through the nutrients like your zinc like selenium uh through nac as well so these are all things that we can potentially look at in terms of bringing that gap in as well so vitamin d is another one that i'll touch on in a little bit time but again all of them play a role in terms of what we're doing but that is the initial phase of what we're trying to look at and ideally in our thymus and our bone marrow that's where we want to be focusing on making sure we're we're filling all the nutrients that we need to produce be able to produce these antigen presenting cells okay so again this is not a any new to anybody but this is just looking at the link between the ability to shed a virus so again with a certain condition with a certain age we are high well we, there's a higher likelihood that we are not going to be able to shed a virus very quickly so the longer we go with a virus prevalent the more that that virus is going to replicate which then increases the potential of the symptoms so again we need to look at the certain conditions, so cardiovascular disease, COPD, those sort of conditions where there's a kind of flared up inflammation where our immune system's slightly out of whack. This is where we really need to be looking at how we can deal with those symptoms. So not necessarily looking at our immune system, but looking at the management of that condition that could potentially improve our immune system, ideally. So that's really what we kind of want to look at in terms of those underlying health conditions so we always look at our short and long-term products and or our short and long-term nutrients and this is something we really, really need to understand in terms of immunity and how we can prevent the suppression of our immune system through kind of managing the conditions that we initially have i know this isn't new to anybody and we aren't the greatest in this country at, at managing our our general conditions through supplementation and through nutrition but it's kind of one of those things that we really need to do is highlight that if we can reduce the potential of these severity or the severity of these health conditions we can actually improve that those conditions with reducing the potential for immune suppression as well so this is the big thing for me in terms of we are seeing more accelerated aging now and we are seeing more mitochondrial dysfunctions and these are all leading to those metabolic dysfunction as well and causing the metabolic diseases which is again then causing an impairment of our or impairing of our immune system as well so there's, there's lots of other factors to, to the immune system rather than just the specific nutrients that play a role with it. But again, we can see the link between lower levels and higher levels of nutrients that are prevalent when we do have a immune disorder or immune kind of suppression of the, the, of the immune system, basically. Right. <clears throat> this is where I was talking a little bit about that innate and adaptive immune system that crossover trying to bridge that gap and kind of close that down this is something that was came about during covid and it was the cytokine storm so a flare-up of cytokines flare-up of inflammation that was kind of being a little bit uncontrolled so this is where the innate immune system is working very unregulated it's not really kind of knowing what to do because again it's a new sort of uh, disease that's coming to our in our, our our body and pathogens and it gave us a good idea of how our body does deal with kind of these initial threats coming into the body and if we do have these long-term chronic health conditions if we do have these elevated environmental risk factors there is going to be a further increased risk of that bridging of that gap to the innate to the adaptive so again if we can reduce the war and kind of 
rectify those modifiable risk, modifiable risk factors, we could potentially, again, help to bridge that gap down and prevent that potential cytokine storm and cytokine flare up from an immune dysfunction. So again, this is something that we really can kind of look at. And we did see the consequences of this was leading to those symptoms that we do see with COVID and any sort of flu, really. So this isn't just COVID specific, but we have learned a lot from COVID in terms of what we can do in terms of regulating our, our body. And still now the research is relatively fresh in terms of COVID directly, which is, is again, it's all mechanistic. The majority of the studies that we see, because it is again, it's the same with the vitamin D trials that we saw. A lot of it was unregulated and not wasn't very specific. The data was all over the place and they actually pulled a lot of vitamin D trials because they didn't actually kind of do them properly and the, there was, the data was all wrong. And so, again, it's still very much up in the air in terms of what we actually do. But all we can look at is the mechanisms directly and just see what what it can actually do in terms of improving our, our, our ability to fend off these conditions. OK, so that's initially about the innate and adaptive immune system, but going on to that post COVID side of things. So now we're looking in terms of the percentage in or the, the percentage complaints of certain symptoms. So we saw that chronic fatigue and pain were at the highest level. So over 55% of individuals were complaining of some form of chronic fatigue and pain. And again, we still kind of doctors and kind of GPs and not necessarily knowing exactly what to do in terms of regulating the symptoms. So we've seen the neurological complaints as well. And then the, the loss of senses, so taste and smell. And then again, lung function was another big one that, that a lot of people experienced. So looking at how we can actually potentially deal with these is is a big big thing so i think that's where we we can try and look at as a as the health industry is where we are seeing a, a, that missing link between the gps and, and medical practices and where we can actually help people understand what they can do to improve their lung function to improve their their brain health and improve their their, their ability to develop the energy side of things so in terms of lung function there's been some good research on the nac side of things and andrographies uh, so they're just two that have kind of very useful in terms of regulating the uh, the lung function so we've seen for years is how good NAC is for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and improving or reducing the uh, the mucus and the uh, cytokine buildup in the lungs. But again, we're also seeing how it can work on the liver and detoxifying the liver. So again, because it was initially used as a as a drug years ago in terms of for paracetamol overdose, and it's still used in clinical practice now. But again we are using this in terms of how we can rectify the lungs, how we can improve our lung function as well. And there's some good research on, on NAC in terms of pulmonary function and in terms of being able to actually improve the, the quality of life through, through breathing as well. So this is something that I've recently been using because I did have quite a, a heavy viral lung infection recently. So, but again, it, it was something I jumped to with that in andrographies as well was something that I uh, did want to use just again, just to improve that, that ability to breathe and improve the, the, the capacity of the, of basically the bronchi to, to, to convert the, the gas chambers basically and, and kind of improve that ability to uh, yeah clear out that mucus. So that's a big one in terms of NAC. So we have seen a lot. I mean, even in terms of NAC, in terms of upper respiratory tract infections, we've seen some good research on there also. But again, it, NAC is probably one of the most popular products that I've seen in terms of research at the moment, just because of where it can fit in. But for lung function and for post-COVID, these are things that we're looking at in terms of helping regulate that. And even black seed oil, for instance, that's another one that's been used for improving lung function. And there has been some studies that have shown that it's improved pulmonary function specific to COVID. But again, those, those studies weren't kind of peer reviewed necessarily. They were early, early on. So again, I didn't want to kind of publicize those too. But again, there's, there is research going on in terms of what black seed can do in terms of the bioactive compound thimiquinone and how that can, can work as well. So yeah, they're, they're just a few in terms of lung function, but there's so many different other things that you could potentially use. But again, those are the three primary ones that I would generally use for those post COVID and improving fatigue. But then going into neurological complaints and senses. So there's some research on zinc at the moment and magnesium in terms of the kind of the smell and taste and getting, getting kind of that side of things back. 
And then in terms of brain fog, neurological, we are seeing B complexes as being the ones that are the go-to. So particularly kind of activated forms of B vitamins are the ones that have been seen to be having the, the most benefit in terms of no, neurological conditions and some herbs like ginkgo as well. So reducing the neuroinflammation and again, helping to re reduce that potential brain fog as well. So there is some, like, again, we, we've got so many nutrients that can work on, on brain health and it, it's just kind of find that, that balance of what we can do. And even looking at, at magnesium, which is kind of up there with probably the most useful nutrients that we've seen. Um, and in terms of immune function, it's, I, I, in my personal view from the research uh, that I've gathered, it's, it is one of those missing links that is is kind of with vitamin D as well in terms of activating the the hormone hormonal form of vitamin D. So again, the biological action of, of magnesium is to help that activation of vitamin D. So again, we are we have been very focused on vitamin D for a very long time. It's vitamin D, vitamin D, vitamin D. We need and then looking at dosages. But what? else are we missing when we kind of scratch below the surface and what are we what else are we needing to do to actually activate that vitamin d as well so these are the things that we need to be looking at it's not just how we utilize vitamin d is how we utilize the other nutrients to to stimulate that that growth of or the, the 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 activation of the hormonal forms of vitamin d as well so again magnesium is one of those missing links and when it comes to neurological conditions we know that it works on the nmda receptor so the the receptor in the brain that controls glutamate and glycine so again that can control our our, our potential brain fog and anxiety and, and depressives kind of side of things when it's alongside these sort of things so again magnesium is one of those missing links that could work alongside neurological complaints and also with vitamin d as well so this is it's huge in terms of what i i've i've seen in the research so again this is something that is i would always push forward for an immune boosting form but also looking at all the other areas so in terms of what the complaints are so in, if it's neurological then i would always go for a magnesium supplement going on to chronic pain and fatigue so again biggest one that we're seeing in terms of uh, of complaints so this is always going to be the hardest one to to deal with because this is going to come down to how well we utilize our nutrients at the end of the day and how good our metabolic function is so this will all go down to how well we can utilize the nutrients coming into our body and activate them into the cells so any mitochondrial dysfunction there is going to be an element of that chronic fatigue and pain and but we can see the mechanisms in terms of the research in terms of looking at how we can improve the redox status of the cells so whether that's through coq10 whether that's through elevated levels of antioxidants like superoxide dismutase for instance so there's so many elements and even nac for for glutathione production for instance so again we're, we're looking at the regulation of the cells how we can improve that so so many times that inflammate like in terms of um, our immune system that is that flare up of of unbalanced redox status basically so again if we can look at the the levels of of uh, antioxidants that we are providing the body to improve that that redox status through our, the natural production as well so through the external and internal forms then we really do need to kind of be focusing on that that initial thing to to improve that that ability to deal with our fatigue and potentially pain as well but i think when we look at the bigger picture of COVID, this is ideally what we really need to be thinking about, about how we can reduce these potential long-term impacts for, for individuals. And I know, I've known people who have suffered quite badly from, from kind of feeling just low energized, energy is just not there at all. So again, it's just trying to find what these mechanisms can do. And again, the research isn't quite there, but we can see what we can, can do in terms of elevating these nutrients to a point where they can be utilized for, for certain individuals as well. Okay, so this isn't going to shock anybody, uh, but this is just, again, a nice research paper. I wanted to include this. So if you want to have a look at this, this paper, it's a nice kind of kind of breakdown of the nutritional requirements during immunity. So again, it's just this is just a, a quick synopsis of the of the article, but basically it's applying good versus good nutrient supply versus bad nutrient supply. And again, we do see that link between kind of increased levels of pathogens versus a good defense against pathogens as well. So it's putting two and two together. But again, I thought I'd just provide and show how vital it actually is. 
Okay, so this this is a good another one that is again just showing you that the link between the nutrients and where we're seeing the 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 influence of nutrients of how we can actually reinforce that immune system and bring it up to a level that is able to 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 kind of detect everything that we need so increase the security guards in our system and and be able to regulate the our our phagocytes and be able to tell them where they need to go in in a more directed fashion really so again all these nutrients are a huge thing and we're seeing more and more kind of influence around our gut microbiota which isn't new again isn't new to anybody but again that is where our, our immune system is initially starting and how we can actually fend off so many things so again if we have a, a certain digestive disorder like leaky gut for instance where there's a kind of the tight junctions are all over the place and it's allowing inflammatory markers to, to kind of increase as well these are all going to start to potentially inhibit our immune system as well so it's not just looking at the microbiota it's looking about how we can actually utilize those enzymes looking at our ph as well so looking at how well we can break down food so people who do have elevated levels of ibs for instance they, they've been shown to have a higher level of immune issues just because again that their, their immune system is not working quite as well because of the increased levels of potential inflammation that's there or the elevated ph that's in their stomach as well so again it's, it's looking at that the, those bigger pictures but one of the biggest ones i would always say is is the moderate exercise so again exercise is brilliant when it comes down to it but we do know a lot of people that push it to a limit that is a little bit too far sometimes and can increase the information and so they use exercise as a way of kind of ethically inhibiting or suppressing the immune system so it's a great way of naturally suppressing the immune system and then seeing what the body's response is so when we do this continually and we're not actually providing the body with what it needs so kind of calories and kind of energy proper energy this is where we start to see again issues with that that kind of increase in potential immune dysfunction as well so we see so many times in terms of weight loss and people with kind of Kind of increased uh, immune dysfunction through poor energy supply and increased energy well in over exercising basically so that's coming a little bit more apparent now and we're seeing it more and more uh but again that's another area where we, we need to be looking at in terms of immune suppression and there's been uh, a lot of research in terms of your beta glucans for instance and uh, looking at how they can prevent or improve our ability to regulate cytokine levels when we are kind of after a, an immune suppression. So they've done kind of trials on, on marathon running and or marathon runners and then looked at how they responded post marathon in terms of their cytokines and the flare up of potential immune uh, dysfunction. So again, we, we are seeing that we, we can see a, a link between preparing our immune system for the, these potential immune suppressions. And again, uh, Glucose is one of the highest in use things of the uh, of the immune system, similar to, to glutamine or glutamate, should I say. So, again, those are two nutrients that we need to be be looking at in terms of the amino acids that we're providing the body and the, the, the actual energy availability that we need to, to kind of fuel the immune system as well. So this is huge in terms of how we train the immune system to develop that's potential to prevent the viral replications in the body. Okay, so now into a little bit more specific nutrients, and this is where so we've we've got a little bit about kind of uh, a little bit here and there, but this is more specific. I mean, glutamine is probably one of my my favorite amino acids in terms of its versatility. So we know its benefits in the gut, but when we see its benefits in terms of the immune system, it's working in so many different kind of inflammatory pathways and intercellular pathways as well. And it can help with the, the recognition of pathogens as well. So it's basically improving our ability or the improving of the cell or immune cells as a to, to kind of be fueled and be utilized and then be able to be more kind of detect more things in the body so again it's another missing link and again when energy deprivation is low or where we have kind of low kind of protein intake this is where we start to see again 
slight, slightly more immune suppression as well. So vegans, vegetarians, the kind of people who generally don't get the right amount of amino acids into their body as well. This is another consequence of that where we start to see issues in terms of getting the right level of those amino acids to support the immune system long term as well. So this is why I would always be kind of favoring glutamine as an a, a immune kind of priming uh, nutrient really. So this is, I didn't want to complicate it too much, but again, when we kind of, not many people really know that glutamate is converted into glutamine through through the body. So again, this is where we, we can be looking at in terms of how our body uh, kind of creates this process and then helps with the, the total ATP production as well. So it's going to help in terms of our energy production and kind of helping with the fatigue side of things as well. But when we look at the, the potential for kind of disease state, so on the right hand side in this graph, we're seeing kind of the link. So on the left hand side, you're seeing kind of the, the link between the improved level of glutamate and the regulation of skeletal muscles and this regulation of the metabolic function compared to a kind of hypercatabolic or starvation phase where there's kind of a disease level and you're seeing the lower level of muscle kind of level kind of level the mitochondrial function and then again you're seeing that inhibition of kind of areas of the body that potentially could be disrupted through immune issues so really that's where we're looking at in terms of glutamine and how it can be utilized within the body now I won't go into products today too much. I will just kind of go into the nutrients and look at what we can, we can do. So going on to zinc now. Now zinc again works across every part of the immune system. So it works on the adaptive and on the innate part, on, on the innate part as well. But what we can see is that it works on the the, the thymus basically and the the ability to to regulate the T cells coming out of there. So regulating the uh, the lymphocytes that can help again go out and kind of create the white blood cells and be prevalent in terms of reducing the potential of infections as well so zinc is prevalent across the total immune system and we see that there is an increase in the the, the potential deficiency as well so we're seeing that that level around 17 to 20 percent kind of worldwide really so it is quite big really when we think about the issue with that and it is shown to compromise our immune system when it's low but we've also seen that zinc can actually improve our immune system even when we don't have a low level of zinc as well so even again again it, it works quite quite well in terms of any kind of body of people in terms of what it what we're trying to look at in terms of elevating our immune system in any which way really so this is looking at the kind of the, the areas in terms of COVID. This was all kind of uh, looking at our, our the ability of zinc to, to improve or reduce the potential of inflammation to prevent the uh, kind of mucus buildup as well. So again, there's some research on zinc being able to be that protective and preventative on its own, but also looking at that kind of induced lung issues so again those with kind of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease those who have had issues with lung function this is where we can kind of see where zinc is playing a different role in as well so in terms of managing that inflammatory response and working on those t-cells as well and potentially limiting those, those kind of cytokine storm levels as well so that's where we really want to kind of be looking at so again zinc is one of those that has been shown to bridge that gap between the innate and the adaptive immune system as well and works specifically along the nuclear factor kappa b pathway as well and that, that's quite significant in terms of preventing the the inflammatory markers as well so that's quite key okay so like i said i'm not going to focus on products too much um but okay on to vitamin c so again vitamin c has had a lot of uh kind of talk in terms of the effectiveness of it but really what we want to be doing is high dose when we are actually ill. And that's when we've seen the research in terms of improving our, our neutrophil function. So this is the general mechanism that we see. So basically by increasing our neutrophil function, so that fa those phagocytes basically, they are increasing the ability of Pac-Man to go around the body and engulf those kind of pathogens or microbes that are potentially causing, causing issues. So this is what vitamin C does by elevating the, to it above what would be a normal level in our body. It's basically going to go around and improve that function, improve the motility of those neutrophils throughout the body as well. So that's what we're looking at in terms of vitamin C. 
Okay, so I'm not going to focus on this one too much because I want to get on to the, uh, the next, onto vitamin D and just clear up a few things in terms of where the, what the research is saying at the moment. And again, there's a lot of talk around kind of the dosages around vitamin D and kind of the upper limit is recommended at 4,000. Uh, but there has been some research that has shown that the 2000 has been the most efficacious uh, in terms of improving our immune system, but also improving our bone mineral density as well. So there was a study that was looking at 400 international units, 4,000 and then 10,000. And it was looking at bone mineral density and the ability of uh, the, the vitamin D to improve that bone mineral density and maintain that over a three year period. So the trial finished and it, it basically showed that 400 was able to actually maintain bone mineral, den bone mineral density and the 4,000 and 10,000 actually worsened bone mineral density and there was an increased risk of hypercalcemia. So again, that's why we want to be looking at the lower levels and not taking bolus doses of vitamin D. So again, we're getting a lot more people ask us for higher doses of vitamin D but there's research show, showing that kind of not adding bolus doses or, or high levels of vitamin D, like a 20,000 a week, isn't as effective as having smaller doses throughout the week. So again, the research is there to show that vitamin D is effective at kind of regulating those levels at a minimum dose of that 1,000 to 2,000 IU and improving the bone mineral density and increasing our inflammatory markers as well. So that's where we're seeing the, the research at the moment. And again, it, it's kind of, we're seeing a lot more kind of uh, people ask, like I said, and uh, unless they're deficient, there is no need for them to be taking high, those high doses that we've seen uh, or people are, are asking for as well. So in circumstances, certain, certain, certain circumstances, yes, there is potential need for that. But again, the research points that kind of taking smaller doses for a longer period of time is more effective than taking one large dose of vitamin D. So again, that's where we're looking at in terms of these side of things. But I know about the time, so I'm going to finish there. There is a bit more. So again, uh, feel free to ask any questions. If uh, you want any further kind of questions later on, you can feel free to email me uh, at uh, phil.b at viridian-nutrition.com. But again, it's um, completely open to any questions or anything. Else. But hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight of what we're looking at in terms of vitamin or kind of nutrients and our immune system and uh, how we can potentially control them as well. So let me just stop the share. There we go. Thank you, Phil. That was, um, that was brilliant. Um, certainly a um, fair amount in there that I, I didn't know and certainly needed to, um, to recap on. It's probably been quite a long time since I've done any official training on immune yeah. health. I think sometimes we kind of go up, well, I do it, not behalf of everybody else, but you kind of go with what you know. And I think there's sort of a, a tendency to do that. And we learn about new things as they come out, but actually doing that kind of big recap on how it all fits together. Um, and I think particularly with related to COVID, long COVID, because so much was coming out along the way that, again, we've sort of picked things up. But to see it all together as one picture was really, um, really helpful. Um, and there's a message in the chat there to say thanks, Phil. Well, that one. Can you see the chat messages? I don't think you can. Is it only Yes, I can. Say? Yes. <laughs> Right, okay, yeah. so, I think everyone can um, see them. Okay, brilliant. Um, so um, we've probably got like five, ten minutes left to answer any questions. Obviously, we're covering a lot in a short um, space of time. Um, so we'll go through some questions. I mean, I know you know Viridian are always kind of so so helpful. So um, I'm sure that you're always well, you're always happy to pick up with people um, afterwards. So let's have a look out. If anyone wants to pop any. You can either pop questions in the chat or literally unmute yourself um, and we can sort of take it from there. Anybody, any more questions? Well, I'm quite interested to know a little bit more on dosage on magnesium. Um, mm -hmm. We're really quite excited. And also formats of it. What do you think is kind of most bioavailable and, and the best time to take it really? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of talk around magnesium in terms of dosage, but the 300 to 600 milligrams has been shown to, to be most 
kind of effective but again it's all dependent on the uh, kind of the, the individual so a good way of uh, looking at kind of if you're taking too much magnesium is if again if you are needing to go to the toilet very quickly straight away that's, that's probably the quickest way of, of knowing if you are taking too much magnesium but again sticking to that 300 milligrams is a great way of just regulating that so what we're seeing is that our eight, around 80 percent of individuals are actually deficient in magnesium so all we're doing is just bringing it up to a level that we're we're kind of sufficient rather than we're bringing it above a, an optimal status as well so but in terms of what we're looking at in terms of, of magnesium dosages and types of magnesium so there's uh so again we we've We've looked at kind of magnesium bisglycinate or magnesium taurate as your amino acid form. So basically they're the ones that can kind of slightly bypass the gut, but they're also the ones that can work more on the brain really, because again, they can cross that blood brain barrier. And that's where we see the, the research on the amino acid form. So when we look at glycine, for instance, that's bound to the magnesium and glycine works on that, that NMDA receptor that I mentioned before in terms of regulating the, the glutamate and uh, the glycine level. So again, helping to control our, our mood and our, our potential anxiety side of things as well. So that's that's where we we kind of see the the research on that but again magnesium citrate is a brilliant one as well so oxide has been shown to uh kind of be a, a slower kind of absorbing form but it can still be absorbed over a longer period of time so those who are particularly sensitive to to magnesium you can use it and drip feed it like at the 100 milligrams at a time kind of thing over a longer period of time and there has been research to show that it, it can still be utilized in the body even though it's consists people consider it as the the poorer form um but it is the most bioavailable form uh not bioavailable form should i say it's the most highest magnesium content uh compared to, to other forms like magnesium citrate is relatively low in terms of magnesium per citrate powder but it's the most bioavailable so that's one you need to be a little bit more careful with in terms of sensitivity to the gut as well so again there's so many different forms of magnesium but magnesium in any way in where how it's delivered is going to be useful and reach any area of the, of the body but in terms of magnesium bisglycinate magnesium taurate more for kind of brain relaxation calming the body down and also for cardiovascular function as well whereas the citrate oxide they're more for your systematic kind of levels of magnesium as well so that's where we kind of look at those sort of forms as well that's great, great. Um, sorry <laughs> i just noticed debbie you'd messaged about a message in about chronic fatigue um is that something specific related to chronic fatigue um any specific questions around, or is that something you think would be great to do as another session? Oh, specific to long COVID, okay, chronic fatigue yeah. long COVID. Yeah, so a lot of this is down to the the kind of the flare up of inflammation and low grade inflammation that's that's prevalent uh, after after COVID. So that's what we, we are seeing. So it's still very hard to, to pinpoint exactly what's causing it, but ideally it is looking at the cells and kind of improving the the cellular function as well so i think if we can look at anything that we're, we're going to improve it's kind of looking at how we can fuel the the phosphates in there so whether that's through ribose for instance or whether that's through increasing our coq10 so you could take a short dose of 200 milligrams of coq10 alongside curcumin uh, so again curcumin can will help mitigate the the inflammation in the body but you're also looking at coq10 working directly in the cells at regulating the redox status would are going to improve the the ability to to utilize energy so if you look at anyone on on statins and that that the link between there's there's a lot of research on there uh but we can see it, it is is very useful in terms of regulating the cells and be, being able to actually improve our our energy function so that's what we want to do but again there's there's so many different nutrients out there and uh, uh but again it is looking at the the cell membranes as well so i always forget about fatty acids and uh talk about kind of improving the phospholipid bilayers and improving the, the kind of those those sort of areas as well so it is huge in terms of what we can look at but again whenever it comes to fatigue you need to be looking at your short term and then long term so in in nutrients and ingredients that you can help someone in terms of kind of helping them come back to the store as well and giving them something that's going to kind of Give them a, a bit of a uh, revitalization initially but then you know talking to them about how they can kind of really improve their their kind of long-term cell health and improve that that energy and uh, reduce the potential fatigue as well great okay. hey. 
the viewers. Um, have you also seen any research <clears throat> in NAC and HIP? Yeah, so there, there's there's more research on NAC in terms of the kind of ADHD and uh, addictive side of things and uh, kind of, well, behavioral disorders really. So that's more working on the uh, the glutamate and uh, or the production of, of glutathione basically. So glutathione needs cysteine, glutamate and glycine to, to create glut uh, glutathione basically. So, but NAC has been shown to be more effective at creating glutathione in itself. And the consequence of that is that it draws glutamate in. So again, that's a neuroexcitatory transmitter. So again, when we have that higher level of excitatory transmitters in the brain, it causes a, an over excitement. So again, this is where we see kind of people with addiction where they've had brain scans and stuff like that. They've got higher level of glutamate available in the brain. So this is where we start to see how we can regulate glutamate and reduce that and reduce the potential over excitement. And, and potential addictive side of things. So that's where we're starting to see more behavioral side of things in terms of NAC and uh, looking at children as well. Brilliant. I feel like I need to go back to school. It's just like there's so much stuff and we could talk about so many different things yeah, here. It is huge. Um, it's huge. Just, just to follow on from um, NAC before, there was one other question in there, which is what's the difference between NAC and NAC plus? So those are two of your products, aren't they? Yeah, so, well, NAC on its own is high potency, and that's more targeted towards kind of COPD and uh, kind of detoxification of, uh, of the liver. But the NAC Plus, it's also got your chromium in there. And it's also got cinnamon in there. So it's all more looking at your kind of brain kind of derived side of things. So it's more looking at that o kind of OCD, the kind of behavioral side of things. So that's the one I would use for that one, but you can still use it for, for lung function as well. It's still a good dose of uh, N-acetylcysteine in there. So yeah, it's a, a nice one. Brilliant. Thank you. I think we're probably a time now. Um, it's, it's been really a pleasure to have you on here tonight, Phil. Um, if anyone's got any questions that they wish to kind of email us and then we can pass that on to Phil, hopefully you'll be up for this. And um, also we'll try and respond to anything. Um, there'll be a handout as well. Um, and also this the video will be available on the NHS members website area as well, um, which may, gives you an opportunity to share it with any of your staff then. Um, Joe. Yes, well, just, I mean, just again, to say thank you for joining. If you've got any feedback as well on these sessions, I mean, this is just the second one that we've done. So any feedback on things you'd like to see included or anything you want us to do differently. Um, and one thought I just had actually, what I personally found quite useful is, is kind of in the beginning, um, we just had a bit of a chat ourselves amongst the stores. So I just wondered if it's useful for people next time, instead of having that sort of waiting room, people just join us, they're here and we can sort of do a bit of, chit chat because I think the main thing we're trying to get across within sort of health stores UK is we are a community and we're sort of all here to help each other um so I don't know if that's something that um we could sort of look at you know just sort of jump in just a little bit before well, we you can, we can talk about that as well Vicky but um maybe that's worth doing because it's it's always nice to hear what's going on in in other stores and what's working for people in a fairly informal kind of way it is. I mean, it, we're just one big community, really, with a lot of brains, with a lot of information. If we can share it more, then we get stronger together, isn't it? Um, and on that note, we have um, Orly Moray, Molay, Molay, and my pronunciation, I please forgive me, Orly. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing her in January, on January the 11th, 6 p.m. again, which is another Wednesday. Um, and she's going to be, she's the Education and Training Manager for Terranova and Bionature. And she's going to be talking about energy and winter blues and kind of, post Christmas recovery really and, and getting the January spirit with us so we're really looking forward to that yeah so. that's good so yeah the general idea is every second when sorry every two months um on the second Wednesday at six o'clock does that make sense <laughs> we'll send something out um so yeah that's the general idea so yes um thank you very much um
from Vicky and I for joining us. Any feedback is always welcome. And is it a little bit too early to kind of wish everyone Merry Christmas? And so we got a little. <laughs> <laughs> too early. Uh, Please don't go there. <laughs> Is everybody ready for the whole the Christmas trading season? Yes. It's working constantly through it. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I, don't, yeah, I want to see you sort of dressed in a Christmas tree at some point, doing a bit of dancing on social media. We'll all give you extra likes and comments. It's all about the engagement. <laughs> Happy to do that, yeah. I think I yeah. should dress Neil up as an elf and get him to do some dancing or something, but yeah. 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 I'll do my best. Oh, sounds fab. We'd like to see a puppy do it. That would be great. Yeah, he's probably the, the most popular thing that we put on Instagram. Any pictures I put up of Ziggy, they're the ones that get the most followers and stuff. So, yeah, should we get you dressed up, Ziggs? No. Uh, we are going to go, I promise you. Just to say, someone's just made a message about how we access the full video. So just to recap, it'll be on the Health Store UK uh, website when we've managed to get it uploaded. Um, so you can all watch from there and share, etc. Um, drop me um, a message or Avril actually, who's the administrator for Health Store UK, and she can share links as well. Fabulous. Nice Thank to see you. everybody. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, bye. Bye.